Hi friends! Today we will be starting with Chapter 7 of Rami Nightingale by Kate DiCamillo and we are going to find out a little bit more about what's going on with these three. Louisiana is the girl that fainted right the first day of um, class and um, has um, betrayed her friend Archie the cat and Rami is there because why she she wants to win the contest and be Miss Florida Tire, and if that happens, then she can go and uh, possibly get her dad to come home because he's left the family. And then we have Beverly Topinski, whose dad is a cop. And so these girls are going to uh, grow together even more as the chapters go along. Chapter seven: They walk together up to Idanee's circular driveway. Now Idanee is the boot-wearing, baton-twirling teacher. Idany was still down on the dock, marching back and forth and twirling her baton and talking to herself. Ramy could hear her voice, a low, angry murmur, but she could not understand what she was saying. I hate little Miss Contest, said Beverly. I hate bows and ribbons and batons and all of it. I hate spangly things. My mother has entered me into every little Miss Contest there ever was, and I'm tired of it, and that is why I'm going to sabotage this one. But there's $1,975 to win, said Louisiana. That's a king's ransom. That's an untold fortune. Do you know how much tuna fish you can buy for $1,975? No, said Beverly, and I don't care. Tuna fish is very high in protein, said Louisiana. In the county home, they only serve you bologna sandwiches. Bologna is not good for people with swampy lungs. This conversation was interrupted by a loud noise. A station wagon with wood paneling on its side was coming toward Idanee's circular driveway very fast. The driver's side back door of the station wagon was partially unhinged. It was swinging open and then slamming shut again. Here is Granny, said Louisiana. Where, said Ramy, because it truly did not appear that anybody was driving the car. It was like the headless horseman, only with a station wagon instead of a horse. And then Ramy saw two hands on the steering wheel, and just as the station wagon pulled into the driveway, spraying gravel and dust, a voice called out, Louisiana Elefante, get into the car! I have to go now, said Louisiana. It sure seems that way, said Beverly. It was nice to meet you, said Ramy. Hurry, shouted the voice from inside the station wagon. Marsha Jean is somewhere close behind, I'm certain of it. I can feel her malevolent presence. Oh my goodness, said Louisiana. She got in the back seat and tried to pull the broken door closed. If Marcia Jean shows up, she shouted at Ramy and Beverly, tell her you haven't seen me. Don't allow her to write anything down on her clipboard and tell her that you don't even know where my whereabouts. You don't know my whereabouts. We don't know your whereabouts, said Beverly. Who is Marcia Jean, asked Ramy. Quit asking her questions, said Beverly. It just gives her an excuse to make up a story. The station wagon shot forward. The back door swung open, then shut with a loud bang and stayed closed. The car accelerated at an alarming speed, the engine roaring and groaning, and then the station wagon disappeared entirely, and Ramy and Beverly were left standing together in a cloud that was composed of dust and gravel and exhaust. As Mrs. Brokowski would say, now remember Mrs. Brokowski is Ramy's neighbor lady. Chapter 8. They seem like criminals to me, said Beverly. That girl and her almost invisible granny, they remind me of Bonnie and Clyde. Ramy nodded, even though Louisiana and her grandmother did not remind her of anyone else she had ever seen or heard of. Do you know, even know who Bonnie and Clyde were, asked Beverly. Bank robbers, said Ramy. That's right, said Beverly, criminals. Those two look like they could rob a bank. And what kind of name is Louisiana anyway? Louisiana is the name of a state. It's not what you call a person. That girl is probably operating under an assumed name. She's probably running from the law. That's why she seems so afraid in that rabbity kind of way. I tell you what, fear is a big waste of time. I'm not afraid of anything. Beverly threw her baton up high in the air and caught it with a professional snap of her wrist. Ramy felt her heart clench in disbelief. You already know how to twirl a baton, she said. So what, said Beverly. Why are you even taking lessons? I guess that it's exactly none of your business. Why are you taking lessons? Because I need to win the contest. I told you, said Beverly, there's not going to be a contest, not if I can help it. I've got all kinds of sabotaging skills. 
Right now I'm reading a book on safe cracking that was written by a criminal named J. Frederick Murphy. Ever heard of him? Ramey shook her head. Didn't think so, said Beverly. My dad gave me the book. He knows all the criminal ways. I'm teaching myself how to crack a safe. Isn't your father a cop? asked Ramey. Yeah, said Beverly. He is. What's your point? I can already pick a lock. Have you ever picked a lock? No, said Ramey. Didn't think so, said Beverly again. She threw the baton up in the air and caught it in her grubby hand. She made twirling a baton look easy and impossible at the same time. It was terrible to behold. Suddenly, everything seemed pointless. Ramey's plan to bring her father home wasn't much of a plan at all. What was she doing? She didn't know. She was alone, lost, cast adrift. I'm sorry I betrayed you. <sniffs> Sabotage. Aren't you afraid that you'll get caught? said Ramey to Beverly. I told you already, said Beverly. I'm not afraid of anything. Nothing, asked Ramey. Nothing, said Beverly. She stared at Ramey so hard that her face changed. Her eyes glowed. Tell me a secret, whispered Beverly. What? said Ramey. Beverly looked away from Ramey. She shrugged. She threw the baton up and caught it and then threw it back in the air again. And while the baton was suspended between the sky and the gravel, Beverly t said, I told you to tell me a secret. Beverly caught the baton. She looked at Ramey. And who knows why? Ramey told her. She said, my father ran away with a dental hygienist. He left in the middle of the night. This was not necessarily a secret, but the words were terrible and true, and it hurt to say them. People are doing that pathetic kind of thing all the time, said Beverly, creeping down hallways in the dark with their shoes in their hand, leaving without telling anyone goodbye. Ramey didn't know if her father had crept down the hallway with his shoes in his hand, but he had certainly left without telling her goodbye. Considering this fact, she felt a pang of something. What was it? Outrage? Disbelief? Sorrow? It makes me really, really mad, said Beverly. She took her baton and started beating the rubber tip of it into the gravel of the driveway. Small rocks leaped up in the air, desperate to escape Beverly's wrath. Wham! 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 Beverly beat the gravel and Ramey looked on in admiration and fear. She had never seen anyone so angry. There was a lot of dust. A car painted a brilliant glittering blue appeared on the horizon and pulled into the driveway and coasted to a stop. Beverly ignored the car. She kept beating the gravel. It didn't look like she intended to stop until she had reduced the whole world to dust. We'll read some more tomorrow.